title of the talk is Beyond Locality Sensitive Hashing. Uh, and this is joint work with Piotr Indyk, uh, Huin Guan, and Ilya Rosenstein. Um, all right, so first of all, uh, let me introduce what is the problem. Uh, so the main problem that I'll be talking about is nearest neighbor search. What is nearest neighbor search? It's a data structure question, right? Algorithmic data structure question, where we have a data set D of points, let's say in Euclidean space, and we want to preprocess it so that later we are given a point query Q. Uh, this is Q. And we need to report the point which is closest to the uh, query point Q. And hopefully we'll do it faster than just going through all the points. Right? And um, this is, so it's a data structure question. Uh, it has what is the motivation? Generally, we think about these points as being in high dimensional space. Why? Because these points usually represent some kind of objects. Uh, so it, basically, the problem models similarity search. And the distance measures some kind of dissimilarity measure between points. And uh, you know, for example, this is you know, some pictures from our beloved MNIST data set. Um, you represent each, Im where these are handwritten images, you represent them, say, as binary, uh, as binary vectors, which are you know, pretty high dimensional. I think this is I don't know, 36 dimensional vectors. And you check that two images are similar by computing the Hamming distance between them, right? Um, so this is, I mean, this is relatively naive, but you know, things only get more complicated than this. So this is, you know, the problems don't get simpler than this problem. Um, so application areas, you know, this is in machine learning, k nearest neighbor search rule, and uh, as such, it is used in many, many application, related applications like image, video, music detection, deduplication um, in bioinformatics, and many others. Um, I, I'm sure you have seen uh, this problem before. Uh, and uh, let me mention that you know, the problem is um, slightly underspecified at the moment. First of all, you know, what is exactly the space? Uh, what are the objects? Uh, what is the distance? And um, there are many options, but let me focus on kind of some of the most kind of fundamental uh, distances in, in high dimensional space, uh, which is Hamming distance, which is exactly the binary vectors, or Euclidean, where we have real vectors in high dimensional space, and we compute the Euclidean distance between them. Uh, let me also mention that this problem is, uh, it seems to be you know, one of the fundamental problems, basic problems in high dimensional geometry because it can be used as a primitive for other problems like finding similar pairs, for example, if you want to do some deduplication, clustering, and other applications. Okay? Um, so, so first of all, you know, I'm, I'm skipping kind of a lot of literature here, but you know, the problem as stated is, is hard and there is the notion of course of dimensionality, so at least Kind of from theoretical perspective, people have started looking at approximate nearest neighbor search. And let me define what it is just so that we are on the same page. Uh, so first of all, let me define a threshold version of a problem uh, where it's called near neighbor as opposed to nearest neighbor, where I'm saying that like rather finding the closest near neighbor, nearest neighbor, I'll find some points within threshold R, right? Uh, so this is Q, this is our ball of radius R. So it is fine to report any of any of these two points. Either of them is fine uh, answer. So this is the R near neighbor problem. Uh, so now let's introduce what is the approximate version. Uh, so imagine C is the approximation ratio. Think of C as being two, for example. Uh, so we're saying that what is a two approximate near neighbor? Um, this is this guarantee. Uh, we are saying that uh, basically as long as there is some point here, meaning that the data structure must report something, it is okay that the data structure actually reports not only something within this ball, but something larger ball of radius maybe twice R. So any of these three points will be an okay answer. Basically, this gray area is, uh, is, is gray. I mean, the data structure may report something from there or may not. And uh, you know, another way to, to think about this, um, uh, so first of all, I should mention that you know, all these algorithms that I'll mention will be randomized, so we'll report a point with probability 90%, and this can be boosted, so I mean, don't worry too much about this. Uh, but just to mention kind of another perspective on what these algorithms achieve, uh, in practice, you can think about that query time will, will be small if there are not too many approximate nearest neighbors. Approximate nearest neighbors are points in this gray area. So if your gray area in particular is uh, is devoid of points, then the approximate nearest neighbor will, will give you the same as nearest neighbor. And if, if there are points there, then the query time might depend on this. 
And this is how oftentimes these algorithms are used, kind of are thought about in practice. Uh, but this is kind of, you know, the theoretical kind of formulation of a problem where we can prove bounds and, you know, some guarantees. Okay, so, uh, so let me introduce kind of one of, the, one of the basic techniques introduced by Indic Matwani in 98. Um, we've called locally sensitive hashing. Uh, so first of all, how many of you have seen locally sensitive hashing one form or the other? Okay, about half of you. Yes. Okay, so uh, I will roughly go through it um, um, in a little bit in the next couple of slides. So what is local specific hashing? Uh, so this green blob is, uh, is our space. Think about it as being Euclidean space. And we have a bunch of points. This is our data, data set, kind of these points. Uh, so local specific hashing uh, basically wants to partition the points, partition the space with the following guarantee. So uh, if the points are closed, uh, I mean, we, we need to think about two regimes, kind of. When the points are closed within distance r, so this is within smaller radius, or when they are far, meaning that the points are far away, outside this gray area, right? So this is kind of some threshold. And we're saying that we want a hash function, a randomized hash function. We are, call, we are calling it g, such that if the points are close, then the probability that they collide, that two points that are close collide is very high, and if the points are far away, then the probability that they collide is small. So geometrically, this is how a hash function would look like. I mean, a hash function partitions the space into parts. So for example, this part, in this part, all the points have exactly the same hash value, right? So, uh, so hash function on a space is equivalent to a space partitioning. And we're saying that, well, if, if, if this is the guarantee that we have, the data structure is very simple. We just construct a hash table, right? Basically, you take a data set, you compute the hash value on each of the points, and you throw all this into a hash table. And for example, this is how the hash table will look like, right? It will, you know, each part will correspond to a hash, hash bucket here. Each, each point goes into its bucket. And uh, at the query time, if we, we have a point query Q, we compute its hash value, go into the bucket, this is the bucket, and we just look at the points that collide with the point, with the query point Q, right? And uh, if, if this is the guarantees that we have, then the algorithm is essentially obviously correct. Basically, if P is the near, near neighbor within distance R, with high probability it will be in the same bucket, and all the far points, all the kind of points which are not near neighbors, uh, will have a very small probability of collision, so they, will, they won't be in the bucket. Okay, um, so this is, I mean, this is not exactly what we can do. I mean, this is, this is too, I mean, too hard of a guarantee to achieve. So usually what we'll achieve, not high, but you know, we'll achieve a smaller gap between these two probabilities, something like not so small versus small, let's say. And then sometimes it, it happens that uh, the query Q, for example, does not fall in the same bucket. In general, we'll think about the probability of collision as being some decreasing function as a function of distance. And, um, and you know, just because your probability of finding the near neighbor is not so small, you'll have to repeat the experiment a few times. This means that you'll construct a few hash tables. Okay, and uh, there is, so, you know, perhaps, you know, you'll do a few of these space partitions and you'll repeat them a few times, and you hope that maybe in one of these three hash tables, there will be one, one of the, in one of the hash tables, our query point Q and the near neighbor will collide. So we'll find it. Okay, so the, the entire data structure is just a few hash tables, each one using a random hash function, right? But kind of a geometric hash function. And the question is, you know, how many hash tables do you need to use? Some n to power rho, where n is the number of points in our data set. And rho is a parameter, it's, it measures the quality of our space partition. And uh, just to define what is uh, parameter rho, let me quantify these probabilities. In particular, let's call this probability P1, this is not so small. This probability P2, this is, not so, this is the small probability. And this is roughly how it looks like on this graph of you know, distance versus probability of collision. 
And rho is such that this equality is satisfied. Right? It's a, the bigger the gap between P1 and P2, the better, the, the smaller is the rho, and the fewer hash tables we need. That's the main idea. Okay, and uh, basically, so this is, I mean, this is what we introduced in IT8. Uh, I need to, you know, to complete, to complete the algorithm, I need to specify some hash functions, right? Um, and uh, I mean, I still didn't specify a hash function which achieves some non-trivial parameter wrong. And um, so first of all, one can think about the hash function as a concatenation of a few primitive hash functions. Um, so we'll get back to it in, in a moment. But let me give you some particular hash function for Hamming space. So Hamming space, again, we have binary vectors of dimension D. Uh, so a primitive hash function will be, so our entire hash function will be a concatenation of a few of them. So one of them will just pick JF, JF coordinate of a point P where J is chosen randomly, right? So it's a random hash function. And uh, if you compute exactly what is the probability of collision under this hash function H for two points P and Q, it is exactly this, where ham of PQ is hamming distance between P and Q. And this is exactly how the probability looks as a graph. Right, it's a decreasing function. And uh, the function G will be a K of such hash functions, which means it's just a projection on K random bits. So you take point P, you pick ran K random bits, this is your hash function. And you can prove that rho in this situation achieves this uh, ratio one over C. Okay? And um, so, so this, is, this is what was known. And you know, what is, what is known now? Um, so this was basically in the end, if you plug in everything, basically Hamming space, will achieve space which is n to power one plus rho, Korea time n to power rho, just because we have n to power rho hash tables, where rho is this uh, one over C. Uh, so in Euclidean space, later, later on, um, we proved that you can actually obtain a better, better quality partition uh, and obtain an exponent which is roughly one over C squared. So for approximation two, maybe for Hamming space, you would get an exponent of a half, so basically root 10. For Euclidean space, in, in the same, for the same approximation, you can actually get better query time, get fourth root of n. Okay? And then, of course, there is a question, can we do even better space partitions, right? And, uh, and this is a very nice question, and people have started thinking about this. And, uh, and then they proved that essentially, no, this is the best this is the best space partition. So for Hamming space, projecting on random coordinates, this is the best space partition for this, for this parameter row. So, I mean, this is a geometric question, and you, know, you can prove lower bounds for it, actually. Um, there is also more what are called cell probe lower bounds, basically lower bounds on, on data structures, as opposed to just geometric statements, um, which prove, I mean, it's a weaker bound, but mostly because I mean, this is com uh, computational complexity, and you know, it's hard to prove uh, very high lower bounds here. Uh, but essentially, it says that you know, with, at least in terms of space, this uh, with space of type one plus one over c divided by something is is at least the right in the right ballpark. Except that the mem number of memory looks up doesn't look the right. But anyways, I mean, there is a lower bounds that indicate that this maybe one over C is, is actually optimal. And, um, and for Euclidean space, it's exactly the same situation, except that instead of one over C, everywhere in the lower bounds, it's one over C squared. So basically, it looks like local intensive hashing is tight. And you know, are we done with this problem, at least from a theoretical perspective? You know, shall we just leave the rest to proving lower bounds that match precisely the uh, the upper bounds. And uh, our main result is that now we can actually improve the nearest neighbor search. So we can, we can go beyond what are the lower bounds for locally sensitive hashing. And in particular, uh, so for Hamming space, we obtain essentially the same, the same type of uh, space query time trade-off, basically. 
uh, where the query time now is n to power rho for rho, which is equal to seven eighths divided by c. Right, comparing to the, uh, the exponent of one over c of unique Matwani. So basically we're saying that, you know, LSH is defined is not necessarily the, the only way to do nearest neighbor search. And uh, we can go below these lower bounds. And, uh, you know, I should mention that, you know, exactly the same statements, again, with one over c squared, hold for Euclidean space as well. Okay, so this work improves both on unique Matwani and on this paper that we had with Piotr, Piotr Indic in 2006. Um, all right, so there are some additional terms, so that, you know, you can believe me that I'm not completely lying. Um, but, you know, you, you should really remember the bound this way, basically, that it goes beyond this barrier of 1 over C. Uh, so I will, I'll try to give you a sketch or proof, I, you know, idea of the algorithm, why can we go below the lower bound, and uh, I'll focus on presenting this nearest neighbor search in Euclidean space. Um, so let me skip these slides because they're uh, a little bit, I mean, these two slides, I mean, I, I'm sure they'll be recorded, uh, basically give some intuition why we can go below lower bound, why localistically hashing lower bound is not necessarily a nearest neighbor search lower bound. Uh, so let me skip this part in the interest of actually describing the algorithm. Um, so the algorithm, really the main idea is to say that we should do hashing that is data set dependent. So the original localization hashing scheme, it says like, okay, we'll, we'll pick a random hash function and we'll partition the space. And then for those hash functions, this is one over C is optimal. So it turns out that one can think about, well, one can change this definition and think about hash partitions which are data dependent. So note that, I mean, this is not necessarily something that is immediately applicable. Um, think about kind of standard universal hashing, for example, right? It is usually you think about hash functions as not looking at the data that needs to be hashed, but chosen independently of the data that needs to be hashed, and then you hash using this hash function. Um, otherwise, you can make a hash function that depends on your data, but if it really depends a lot on your data, then computing that hash function is, is very hard. So probably the closest to the notion of data dependent hashing is perhaps something like perfect hashing. Um, so, so basically this is the idea, to do, to do space partition that actually looks at the data set and manages to partition, partition it such that we get a better, um, better quality. And, uh, and you know, the cool part is that it really works in the worst case. So for any worst case data set, you can look at the data set and partition it better than if you were to use a random hash function. Okay, so there are two components to the algorithm. Uh, one is, you know, I will present you essentially one nice combinatorial uh, configuration, geometric configuration of points, where you can actually achieve exponent row which, which beats this LSH lower bound. And then there will be a second component will say that, well, we can take any worst case point set and we can pre-partition it and reduce to this nice geometric configuration. Okay, so let me start with a nice geometric configuration. And uh, one way to think about this is uh, it's the Euclidean, Euclidean equivalent of a sparse point. Um, so well, what is it? Uh, it is, we take a ball of radius uh, CR divided by root two, and we have on it uh, a lot of random points which are a distance CR. Um, so note that this is essentially the tightest way to pack a lot of points uh, which are a distance CR from each other. All right, so if you take a lot of points, distance CR, and you really tight, uh, uh, try to pack them tightly, I mean, essentially this is what you'll get. I mean, you'll get a ball of radius CR by root two, and, um, and this is how they look like. And it turns out that if all your points lie on, on this ball of radius CR, you can obtain, there is a partitioning of this data set, uh, which achieves a row which is equal to half divided by C squared. Right, so, so if you're, this is the nice geometric configuration. 
And uh, let me just show you how this roughly looks like. Um, so the proof or the algorithm essentially just does cap carving. Cap carving means that we draw maybe a line at certain distance from the, from the center, and this corresponds to one bucket, right? So this is a hash function. Uh, you draw another, you, you carve out another cap, this is another bucket, and so forth, until you have covered the entire sphere surface. And this is the partitioning. And this is similar to ball carving that uh, has been used originally for coloring of graphs uh, and later for one of the, one of the LSH algorithms. Um, and you know, I, I won't show you any analysis here, but you know, you have to believe me that these, I mean, this can be massaged to obtain rho, which is roughly half by C squared. So this is already the improvement. And uh, you know, natural question is like, you know, is this robust? You know, can we? What, what if we have the sphere which is a little bit larger? And you know, f what you expect will happen, uh, namely, if you have radius which is by a constant factor larger, then you have rho which slowly degrades with the with the radius. So if the radius begins to be much larger than the, distance, the average distance between points, then you don't get any improvement. But I mean, if you're more tightly packed, then you get some improvement over standard LSH. Okay, so this is, this is a nice configuration. And now the question is, you know, if, if, all our, if our data set was at the beginning given like that, then it would be good. We, you know, improved the LSH. Um, but uh, what if we are not? Uh, and the reduction, the reduction to, into this situation, um, we call it a spherical LSH, uh, is, uh, is actually to use LSH itself, a regular LSH, to reduce to this situation. The intuition being, uh, and this is kind of, this is the best Euclidean, uh, local intensive hashing in Euclidean space. Um, the, the intuition is that local intensive hashing I mean, by design, is, uh, is a partitioning of a space so that the far points don't collide. So if we apply a few rounds of, of local intensive hashing, we expect that, the, um, that if we look at each bucket of the points, the points will be tighter, more tightly, uh, tightly concentrated. We expect that the points, the, the diameter of the points that will actually decrease and we'll get closer to this tightly packed point set situation. Um, so basically, you know, the intuition would be that, you know, we apply a few rounds of local intensity hashing, we pre-partition the point set into rough buckets, we hope that those buckets have small diameter, we find minimum closing ball, and on this minimum closing ball, we'll apply this nice geometric configuration partitioning, okay? So there is, uh, so let's do it by, uh, by picture. So suppose this is our uh, the point set. Um, so at the beginning, the ball carving, essentially, this is how the LSH, regular LSH looks like. It will roughly partition, it will carve out of the space these big balls, uh, big spheres. And uh, once we, and it pre-partitions the space into smaller radius point sets. And then inside each, each of these balls will find the, these sets of points which are much more tightly concentrated than originally. We'll draw minimum closing balls around them. And on each of these minimum closing balls, we'll, draw, we'll apply these sparse or spherical local intensity hashing, this nice configuration partitioning of the space. Okay, so formally, kind of, you have a function g which first partition the points by so you can think about data structures at three, essentially, where, where at the beginning you apply a few rounds of this nice, uh, of this regular standard local intensive hashing, you pre-partition into different parts, and on each part will be its own hash function, which depends on, on, on the configuration of the points there, um, and you'll apply these special hash functions there. Um, and basically, the final row is an average of the row from the levels one and two. So basically, whatever row is obtained here, which is basically standard LSH, and this one, which has an improved row. So it will be some kind of average. And you know, messaging all the numbers, you'll get this bound of seven eights. 
Um, let me skip the details. I mean, not as important. Uh, but uh, let me let me mention just a word on practice. Um, so in, in practice of nearest neighbor search, it's often the case that the, the I mean the algorithms are a form of space partition, and there are many of them, and many of them are data dependent. Um, so for example, I mean, some of the some of the nearest neighbor search, some of these algorithms use random dimensional reduction, Johnson Lierhaus lemmas. And uh, in practice, people will say, like, well, whatever, you know, theoretician comes and says, like, use random notion reduction, let's use PCA instead. Um, so, you know, these kind of intuitions have led to a lot of trees. I mean, okay, some of them existed before that, right? But, you know, things like PCA trees or SP trees, uh, we'll say, let's partition the space according to, not randomly, but according to the geometry of the space. We're using PCA, for example. And, um, you know, PCA tree would look something like that. Uh, but often the case, it, you know, first of all, there are no guarantees. And for all these algorithms, it's pretty easy to construct examples where we will fail on finding nearest neighbor search. Um, so, so kind of, you know, this, this angle, kind of, you know, it's natural to ask kind of, you know, can we bridge this gap? So first of all, until recently, until this work at least, the theoretical algorithms for nearest neighbor search have not been data dependent. Whereas in practice, you know, they are data independent and often they do outperform some of the theoretical algorithms. And the question is to bridge this gap. I mean, can we, can we analyze some of these algorithms? Can we, uh, you know, prove that some things will work or um, maybe there are variants of them that will give guarantees? Um, and, you know, are, are there better ways to do partitions in theory and practice? I mean, this is really the question. Um, so, or another question, you know, more particular, I say like, well, maybe some of these algorithms actually do work in certain, in certain regimes. I guess I just want to mention this work that we're doing with Amir Abdullah and Ravi Kanan and Robbie Kraufgamer, where we're looking at PCA trees and trying to prove that they are, um, you know, they do, they do very reasonable things under certain assumptions on the data set, actually. Um, but anyways, let me just conclude. Um, so back, I mean, this talk is about beating the local intensity hashing. So this is the first work that goes beyond the original Indic Matwani algorithm for Hamming space. So we, for example, for Hamming space, we obtain seven eighths divided by C. Um, so the really, really interesting part is that it's below the lower bounds that have been proven for, for local intensity hashing. And the idea is really to do these data dependent space partitions. And uh, you know, of course, the natural question is, you know, how far can we push this? Um, you know, in, in theory, for example, can we, what is the raw that we can obtain? For example, already a natural idea is to try to use multi-level partition. So, you know, probably some of you have been thinking, it's like, okay, why do we do only two levels? Uh, maybe we can do mo more levels. And it's true that we can, you know, kind of make this algorithm multi-level partition kind of. Each time you, you refine, you improve the geometry of your point set and you, uh, use more particular, you, you adapt your hashing to the improved configuration. And it will work and it will achieve a little bit better exponent, something like 0 0.73 divided by C. Um, and I don't know, I mean, basically, I would conjecture that this, is, this might be the right bound in, for this direction, but we still don't know how to obtain this. And of course, you know, the question is, you know, can we, going back to kind of the connection between theory and practice, you know, can we bridge this gap between you know, space partitions in theory, space partitions in practice, and you know, what are the best in theory and practice? Thank you. <laughs>